Hello again, HI122. In this video, I'm going to go over some of the issues in Chapter 18. This is European history again now. We're going to spend some time on that for the next few chapters. And this chapter mostly is about the French Revolution. The first question, describe how Spain and Portugal governed their colonies in Latin America, basically paternalistically, using the encomienda system and slavery was introduced into those big plantations that they established in many of these colonies. If you want more on that, see the chapter reading. I go into a lot more detail than that. The revolution in France. The root causes are in the condition of French society. Before this revolution in 1789, this is a society that's grounded in privilege and inequality. It's divided into three orders or estates. The first estate consisted of the clergy and numbered about 130,000 people who owned 20 or 10 percent of the land, excuse me, and the clergy was exempt from the tal or the tie, the tax. And these clergy were also radically divided. The higher clergy, stemming from the aristocratic family, shared the interests of the nobility, while parish priests were often very poor commoners. The second estate was the nobility, composed of about 350,000 people. They played an important role. They held many of the positions in government and the military, and they sought to expand their power at the expense of the monarchy and to maintain their positions in government. Common to all nobles, were they were also exempt from the tithe, the tax. The third estate of the commoners were the overwhelming majority. Peasants constituted 75 to 80 percent of the population. These are the people who pay the taxes. They owned about 30 to 5 to 40 percent of the land, although Half had little to no land on which to survive. There's no serfdom anymore, but there are many relics of feudalism or aristocratic privilege. Peasants had to pay fees for using facilities, such as the flour mill, the oven, or the wine press. Another part of the third estate were skilled craftsmen, shopkeepers, or urban wage earners. In the 18th century, these groups suffered a decline in purchasing power as prices rose faster than what they were making. About 8% was the bourgeoisie or the middle class. They owned about a quarter of the land. And this group included all of the new occupations that had been developing because of the industrial age. And they had benefited from economic prosperity after 1730. problems. Although they had had some very good decades of prosperity, there were two bad harvests in two consecutive years. And there was also the beginning of a manufacturing depression that resulted in food shortages, rising prices for what food there was and other goods, and unemployment in the cities. And the monarchy doesn't seem able to address these problems. Louis XVI had become king at an early age. And he didn't know very much about the operations of government. He liked tinkering with watches. He really wasn't in, interested in political affairs. And his wife was a spoiled princess who devoted much of her time to court intrigues. There is a big reading on this in the text if you are interested. The immediate causes were the collapse of government finances. All the wars that Louis XIV and XV had fought had bankrupted the French government. And because they're on the verge of a complete financial collapse, Louis XVI was forced to call a meeting of the Estates General, the parliamentary body that had not met since 1614. That's 160 something years. When the first estate declared in favor of voting by order or as a block, which means that the first and second estate can outvote the third estate, two to one. The third estate responded dramatically. On June 17, 1789, they declared itself a national assembly, and they prepared 
to draw up a constitution. And the first, this is the first step in the revolution because the third estate had no legal right to act as an assembly. Louis XVI sided with the first estate and prepared to use force to dissolve the estates general. The common people, however, saved the third estate because on July the 14th, 1789, a mob of Parisians stormed the Bastille, the royal armory, and proceeded to dismantle it brick by brick. Louis XVI was soon informed that the royal troops were unreliable. Louis's acceptance of that reality signaled the collapse of royal authority because the king could no longer enforce his will. And this is a symbolic portrait representation of the storming of the Bastille. One of the first acts of the National Assembly was to abolish the rights of landlords and the fiscal exemptions of those groups. And three weeks later, the National Assembly adopted the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. This charter of basic liberties proclaimed freedom and equal rights for all men, but not women. Much to the dismay of Olympe de Guse. And there's a big writing in the textbook about the Declaration of Rights of Women, if you're interested. And these public offices from now on should be based on talent or merit. All citizens have the right to take part in legislative processes. Freedom of speech in the press was coupled with the outlawing of arbitrary arrests, the rights of man. By 1791, the National Assembly had completed a new constitution that established a limited constitutional monarchy. This is the first stage of the French Revolution. There's still a monarch now called the King of French, but sovereign power was vested in the new legislative assembly which would make the laws. Thus the old order had been destroyed, but the new order had many opponents, Catholic priests, nobles, the lower classes hurt by the rising cost of living, peasants opposed to the dues that had still not been eliminated, and political clubs like the Jacobins that offered more radical solutions. And the king also made things more difficult. And that's the end of the first part of the French Revolution.